Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this week's Everton show. It's one of the busiest weeks in the Merseyside sporting calendar, of course, with the wonderful spectacle of the Grand National at Aintree on Saturday afternoon. We're approaching the final few furlongs of the football season too, with still very much to play for. To analyse and review a busy old period for Everton and to hopefully along the way give us the winner of the Grand National itself. It's a pleasure, as always, to welcome Graeme Stewart. We'll have a chat about the National later in the programme, Graeme, but it's important for Everton not to let the season just fizzle out now with regards to the Premier League. Yeah, very much so. I mean, we've still got plenty of games to play in the Premier League. Um, we've got to try and improve our, our position there. And obviously you've got the, the glory of the FA Cup semi-final and hopefully a final to come as well. And important the players stay focused, keep their form up, maintain you know, that momentum, take it into the semi-final. Must be a motivation, mustn't it, the semi-final? Well, it should be. Of course it should be. I mean, motivation to, to win three points in Premier League games, to perform well and make sure the manager picks you in that starting eleven at Wembley. Well, plenty more to come from the Diamond in this week's programme. And as always, we've got plenty of variety for you over the next hour or so. I played my first game at home against Birmingham City. How good is in pot? We won the game 3 1. Uh, but, you know, to come out onto that pitch as a young boy standing in, in the terrace, it was like it, it, quite emotional, really. It, it, it's a big thing for me, really. Two seasons, Romero scored a lot, a lot of goals. I think now he's the best choice uh, for the striker in the national team because he's my friend. Well, that defeat against United at Old Trafford was a third straight loss in the Premier League. But after the game, John Stones agreed with my suggestion that just now everything that can go wrong is going wrong. A lot of uh, un unlucky things that happened to us today. Um, we hit the bar, we had uh, plenty of chances to, to win the game. And, you know, as you say, the, the things that are going wrong are, are costing us. When we had our moments, we had them reeling, didn't we? We did, yeah. It's a frustrating thing, really. You know, we, we come off the pitch feeling we've, feeling you know we've we've just lost. But you got to take some positives. And, and defensively, I thought we looked so strong. And set for the set for the goal that that uh, creeped in at the back post. And you know, I think we should be should be you know confident in in going forward that we need to to bring this bring this performance to the table. You know, week in week out, and then go go and express ourselves to score goals. But this is not the best Manchester United side we've faced at Old Trafford. There's very much a feeling that possibly they're for the taking today. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the past few times that we've been here, we've, we've felt that. and um, It's the only few times that I've been here, to be honest. But, um, yeah, you definitely feel that you can you can turn them over. Even at our place, um, you know, they're not, they're not the outfit that, that they used to be. And definitely today we came here with that mentality that we could, you know, put one over them. It shouldn't really dent the confidence too much, John. As a young player, when you look around the dressing room, you see quality everywhere you look, don't you? Yeah, definitely, and that's what that's what we need to, to keep working at. And I think we just need to keep gelling and and and, and improving on the things that that aren't going right. And you know, some things you can't you can't put right and look and things like that. But the things that we can control, we need to we need to keep putting right in training and keep going because we've got the players and we've got the the work rate and we showed it this season that we can do it so we need to go in the right direction. It was a compelling game rather than an entertaining game wasn't it because neither goalkeeper really was threatened an awful lot. Not at all. Um, I don't know if Joel had a save to make and um, I'm not sure at the other end really. We, we hit the bar and um, they had some, some good good blocks and so did we and it wasn't it was always going to be a one nil from from the first minute. I think once once the game got got, got going, and um, you know we need to capitalise on those moments in a game where we can see it, it's it's going to be a scrappy affair, and we need to grab it with both hands and run with it. Couldn't hide his disappointment there, could he, John Stones? Well, there were a couple of thousand frustrated Evertonians at Old Trafford on Sunday afternoon, that's for sure. The general consensus was very much that United were there for the taking. And Roberto Martinez certainly shared the supporters' disappointment. 
and you could see that the first half we were showing a great degree of concentration. I thought the way that we we approached the game was was very good, and very much in our favour. You look, you come into Old Trafford and you're looking at the the, the little actions that Joel Robles was was involved in. It shows you that we stop uh, Manchester United. We made it very difficult for them at times. It's almost uh, we didn't pick. The, the right timing of, of that uh, final pass or that uh, attacking pass that we we could have, we could have take advantage a, a little bit better. It's just the disappointment it comes when in the second half it seems a very comfortable um, display and we, we we lose concentration and we allow a very soft call. And we 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 haven't got those those standards at all, especially away from home. We've never been that loose and that goal in a way uh, it put us a bit. We felt so um, uh, probably so rushed that we we start reacting with our heart rather than our head, and, and we pick wrong op options. But we still always felt that we were well in the game. And you're looking at the the, the crossbar and the second opportunity that Phil Jagielka had the ball from across the the goal from from Seamus Coleman. Um, I think we should have get more opportunities, but. We created enough compared to what Manchester United uh, did, uh, and that's probably the hardest thing to take from a from a result uh, like that. We know how good a team we can be. I think is what's very important in any game is that you reflect that in in the score lines. And if you cannot win a game when it's that level, uh, you cannot lose it. And that's probably the, the the feeling of disappointment that we're taking with us. Diamond, both the gaffer and John Stones, they're alluding to the fact that it was a sloppy goal to concede. But apart from that, I thought the defensive display was fairly solid. Yes, I mean, John said there in his interview, you know, very few chances. I'm not so sure that Joel had too many saves to make, if any. Um, but again, the downside is it's a sloppy goal. Mm. And that has cost us and it's, it's burnt us so many times this season. And we can't keep doing it. Somewhere along the line, we've got to stop it happening. And... You know, it's easy for us to sit back and criticise and say, oh, you know, this, that and the other. But, you know, these lads are trying, mm -hmm. you know, that they are. It would, you know, that was not a that was not a, a, a game I felt we deserved to lose. Um, but you can't hide away from the fact that if you concede sloppy goals, you're going to lose games of football. And somewhere along the line, we've got to turn it around. It does seem, doesn't it, that every single slight defensive lapse or lack of concentration and boom, the ball's in the back of the net. Yeah, but that's the harshness of the Premier League. Mm. You know, and they're the lessons that we've got to learn and we've got to learn them quickly. You know, you only switch off for a, you know, a, a millisecond and the ball can be in the back of your net and unfortunately, it's a tough place to learn the Premier League. It's not the best Manchester United side either, is it? No, no. I think, I think they've done as well as they possibly could be in terms of their league position. Um, I'm not so sure that they'll beat West Ham at Upton Park in the, in the replay. No. Um, I would, it wouldn't surprise me one little bit if we if we were lining up against West Ham again in the semi-final. It's not the Manchester United of Beckham, Keane and Giggs, is it? That's for sure. Well, last Saturday morning at Finch Farm, the Everton under-18s played the third game of their National Premier Academy Playoff League and they duly recorded their second win. The Young Blues are now third in the table behind Chelsea and Manchester City. Here's the pick of the action from last weekend's 2-1 victory against Blackburn Rovers. Everton under-18s kept up their challenge for the Academy Premier League title with a 2-1 victory over Blackburn Rovers on Saturday afternoon. Delisle Brewster netted the winner in the Dallas Cup final six days earlier and the forward crashed an early effort against the crossbar. Despite dominating the opening half, Everton had to wait until the 52nd minute to take the lead when Rovers defender Ben Williams put into his own goal following good work down the right from Shane Lavery. The advantage was doubled shortly afterwards and it was Lavery who was involved once again. The Ireland Youth International combined with Brewster and found himself through on goal before firing into the roof of the net. Blackburn got themselves back into the game with a quarter of an hour remaining when the referee pointed to the penalty spot after Joseph Yarny had fouled Joel Steer. Rovers midfielder Joseph Grayson stepped up and sent Blues keeper Kieran O'Loughlin the wrong way to give his side a glimmer of hope. Sheedy's side held out for the victory to end what has been a memorable week for the under-18s. Diamond, some of the boys that played in that game against Blackburn Rovers at Finch Farm had been in Texas for the Dallas Cup. They'd been there for 10 days, they'd worked ever so hard, played four or five games, won the trophy and then came back. So fair play to them for being switched on straight away. Yeah, of course, and I'm sure the, I'm sure the coaching staff would have made sure that, look, you know, you've had your glory, but now we're back to the bread and butter. You know, get your heads down and let's get the victory. And, you know, two one, you know a 2-1 win, it, it represents a, a good little end to the week there because uh, it's not always easy to come back and, 
you know, at the heights of the Dallas Cup to then play a regular, you know, uh, league game. But they've done very well for themselves, the lads there. The mathematics as regard that playoff phase are beautifully simple. If Everton win all their games, they will be the national champions again. And to do that for the second time in three seasons would be terrific. It would be terrific. And, you know, all the credit in the world, you know, to all the coaching staff down at Finch Farmer and to the players and the dedication and, and, and the skill that they're showing, if they can do it, it's still a, it's still a difficult, you know, scenario for them. But they, they've shown that they've got a bit of grit and spirit about them, that's for sure. We were talking about Delisle Brewster on the show last week because he's a, he's a neighbour of yours, he's from mm. that neck of the woods and the boy certainly knows where the back of the net is. He certainly does, yeah. I mean, he was a bit unfortunate there with the one that crashed against the crossbar, but Delisle's showing some good signs and he'll be full of confidence. You know, he's a good lad, he's willing to learn, he's, he's strong. You know, and he's, as you say, he certainly knows where the back of the net is. So, you know, a good opportunity for him going forward to, to keep impressing the management because no doubt the manager will be looking at him as well. So, certainly one for the future, hopefully. As long as he doesn't bump into you and snods when he's out <laughs> locally. And that wraps up part one of this week's programme. We'll show you a few adverts now and when you come back to us, we'll be ready with some action from the under-21's latest win. We'll preview the under-18's derby this weekend and we'll watch Graeme Stewart pulling pints behind the bar. Anything to avoid paying for them. Welcome back to part two of this week's show. Well, just before the break, we enjoyed the goals from the under-18s win against Blackburn Rovers last weekend. And this coming Saturday, the lads are in Merseyside Derby action. Kevin Sheedy looks back at the win against Blackburn and also eyes up the weekend's big Derby showdown. Sometimes, you know, after the tournament in Dallas, it can be a little bit after the Lord Mayor's show. But I was well pleased with the players' uh, commitment and effort again from the first whistle. Um, we totally dominated the game. I think 2-1, to be fair, flattered them. We were in comfortably 2-0, conceded a late penalty, and you're always on the back foot a little bit. We saw the game out and, uh, you know, keeping our winning run going. Is it even more rewarding when you consider the efforts the lads put in over the previous week and a half over in America? Indeed, you're always a little bit concerned whether they'd be a bit leggy or, or not, but you, you couldn't have told. You know, they, they, they ran the same as they had done and um, you know, gave it everything they got. And we got lots of players in the, in the, in the team who were good on 1v1 situations, so we, we utilised that. And as I say, we scored two, created a, a lot more chances, which we didn't take on the day. And then sometimes, you know, it's a dangerous scoreline 2 0, then you, you leave yourself open, gave away a sloppy penalty, as I say, but uh, the lads dug in when they needed to, and we, uh, we got the win. A big result in the context of the league season as well. It, it boosts our title push. Indeed, yes. I mean, uh, I said to the lads, you know, we've got four cup finals left. If we win the four games, uh, we, we'll win the league. So it's, it's in our own hands. So um, we're more than capable of doing it. But starting with Liverpool on Saturday, uh, be a real tough game. They're a good side. Obviously, our, our local rivals. And uh, hopefully they, they put out their strongest team um, because you want to, you know, play the best teams and, and, and compete against them and judge your players against them. So I'm sure they'll be coming here fired up and uh, I'm looking forward to a really entertaining game. Damn it, it doesn't matter what the age group is. Everton against Liverpool, we want to beat them. Yeah, give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. There's that extra bit of spice. I mean, Sheed's alluded to it there, the importance. Four cup finals, this is the first one, and it doesn't get much better than a derby game. So, come on, the lads. The key word down at Finch Farm is all about development, developing the players. But surely, when you play Liverpool, just go and get the win. Yeah, I mean... You, you know, in the big scheme of things, you want, the, you know, you want your purest football and, and you, you want the lads to develop. But, you know, a bit of crash bang wallop on a Saturday morning <laughs> won't go amiss when it comes to a derby game. A few tackles and, you know, Sheed has played in many a derby. He knows what, what it's all about. He knows the, you know, what's required and he'll, he'll make sure the lads know, know that come the kickoff. And he'll also make sure they don't get too hyped up before the game. Well, it's, 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 it's a fine balance in acts, mm. isn't it? You know, you need that fire in the belly, ice in the mind. I say it all the time, <laughs> Des. And, but it's, it's, it's a brilliant, you know, eulogy to use. You know, it's, mm. it's, you do need, you need a bit of fire and passion, but you need the calmness in your head. Good luck to the young players against Liverpool in the Merseyside derby. Well, we're edging up the age scale now to the under-21s. David Unsworth boys made the long, long trip to Carrow Road earlier this week, where they recorded an excellent victory against Norwich City, a victory that keeps them in fourth place in the Barclays Premier under-21s table. Everton under-21s returned to winning ways with a 2-1 victory over Norwich City at Carrow Road on Monday evening. The Young Blues converted some early pressure to open the scoring in spectacular fashion as Kieran Dahl found the net with a stunning 25-yard drive midway through the first half. The visitors doubled their lead on the stroke of half-time and Dowell was again involved. 
The 18-year-old seized possession before beating his marker and finding Harry Charsley. His shot cannoned back off the post and into the path of Anthony Evans to tap home. David Unsworth's side controlled proceedings in the second period, but the Canaries managed to find a way through five minutes from the end. A deflected shot fell to Jamal Lewis at the far post, and the winger took a touch before firing home from an acute angle. But the strike proved little more than a consolation, as the Toffees climbed to fourth in the Barclays Under-21 Premier League. Diamond, a terrific victory there for the young lads, but Norwich City away on a Monday night, is there any... Real need for that. Can it not be regionalised, the under-21s league? It could be, I'm sure. But then again, you know, you, you, what about when you get to the first team level? You can't complain about it then, so why not learn as a young player that you're going to have to tra travel and you're going to have to deal with, you know, doing four or five-hour trips and, and getting out there and playing. So in that respect, I'm sure the under-21 league will be tinkered with a little bit somewhere yeah. along the line. But yeah, it's no, so, no bad thing teaching the lads that, you know, you've got to deal with the travelling side of things as well. We enjoyed that goal from... This fellow again, didn't we? Keelan yeah, Dowell, it's, uh, it's his trademark. Yeah, very much so. He's making a decent name for himself, Kieran. So, you know, long may that continue. And I'm sure he's probably got his eyes set on, you know, at least making the bench at some point this mm. season. He impressed you in the summer, didn't he? He played in a couple of the friendlies. And up in Scotland, he was terrific. He was. He's, 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 he looked bright. He looks like he, he's, he's definitely got a goal in him. We mm. see that. He's got a terrific strike on him as well. It's all about keep developing, keep his head down, keep that attitude right. The biggest thing with these young players is to make sure you don't get carried away. And I'm, we've got a good set of lads up at Finch Farm. I'll make sure that won't happen to him. But uh, all he can do is keep performing at the highest level. You know, make sure he's, he's consistent as possible. Keep putting the ball in the back and then he'll get his opportunity. And keep shooting from distance, that's the message. Right, something different now. Who's your favourite TV bar person? Remember Dirty Den in EastEnders? What about Bet Lynch in Coronation Street? Or Mike in the Nags Head who served Dell and Rodney? Well, my mate Diamond is better than a lot of them. He was at the beer keller recently to help promote Chang Beer. And you know what? He did very well. It is the first pint I've ever pulled, yeah. I mean, a little bit frothy the first one, but the second one was all right, Des. I'd have, I'd have accepted it if I was paying for it. Future career? Possibly. Depends if you lot sack me, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's always nice to help out our friends from Chang, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. I mean, we've had a long-standing friendship with Chang over the years, and uh, now it's great to know that you can come down to the beer keller here in Liverpool and get a nice pint of cold Chang. They're such easy people to help out, aren't they? Well, of course they are. I mean, you know, whenever we visit Thailand and, and see our friends from Chang, they're very hospitable to us. The least we can do for them is uh, engage with them down here in Liverpool and, and, and promote, their, promote their beer. And after you skillfully pulled your first pint, you obviously got the chance to taste it as well. Yeah, it's more enjoyable to drink it than pull it, let me tell you that. So uh, I'll sit the other side of the bar, thanks. Graeme, when we were down in London with the chairman, when you were unveiled as ambassadors with uh, Sharpie and Snods, the chairman did promise you it was a varied role. He wasn't wrong, was well, he? He wasn't wrong, was he? No, he's... Uh, I mean, it's this enjoyable part of the, of the job, Daz. It's got to be said. I mean, don't get me wrong. Look, the, the, the football's the, the, the highlight of everything. We absolutely live for the games of football and the excitement of that and what have you. But, you know, pulling the old pint of Chang and sinking it pretty quick afterwards <laughs> was quite exciting along the way. I was just about to say, what did you do with the pints that you pulled? They disappeared down my Gregory very quick. <laughs> As I said in the interview, though, they are terrific people at Chang, aren't they? Very easy to work with. Yeah, they are. They're lovely people. We've had the pleasure of getting to know them pretty well over the last couple of years, uh, especially. And, and they're up for a bit of fun as well. They like a good time, but... Uh, as I said, they're very hospitable people, very friendly people, and they, they, want, they want what's good for Everton Football Club, yeah. along with, you know, promoting Chang themselves. But... Uh, Great people, always look forward to seeing them. It's a friendship, isn't it, rather than a partnership? Yeah. That's how we look at it. Right, let's get back to the football. One of the most eagerly awaited days in the Finch Farm calendar is when the first team finish their training session and make their way across the complex to join all the young kids from the various age groups who are being put through their paces. It's a lot of fun, and this is what we call Academy Day. Yeah, it's been an academy day, uh, just to come down and see the kids, you know what I mean? It's uh, try and beat them at five a side. <laughs> What's your feel to do? I'm sure that every one of these boys is going to remember a day like this and look forward to it next year. I, I think it's just, it it's just fun. Everybody's smiling, everybody's talking. It's as if someone's calling out Rom or Jerry and they're talking as if they're teammates. And it's just, it's a lot of fun to see. Yeah, it's been brilliant. It shows you how, how together they are. 
Um, and it's, it's great, great for the kids and it's great for the players. I used to love it as a player. I mean, they don't know me now, like, but uh, I remember their mums and dads know me a wee bit, but the kids are still made up, aren't they? They're just delighted. Yeah, it's been good. Uh, the weather's not been too bad either, so uh, good uh, laugh. A few of the boys have played the tennis, a few of the boys are joining a couple of five sides. Got a few bumps and bruises from the young lads, but you know, it's always part, part and parcel of uh, coming down, having a little laugh with the, with the youngsters, and not that they needed any sort of help enjoying themselves, but hopefully we've uh, made a few people smile today. Parents are a really important part of this journey that these boys are about to embark on. So to have them involved, have them seeing it firsthand, I think helps them be able to reinforce and, and be able to share those experiences with their sons. You could just see it from the smiles on their faces and you know they were trying to do nutmegs and do all the skills they could possibly do to make uh, all the players look daft. Uh, and every time they did manage to do something it just made the day and I'm sure they'll talk to their, their mates about it for months to come. Graham, we heard from Peter Vint there, the new academy manager. You and I and Snods and Sharpie met with Peter. He's a lovely guy, full of enthusiasm, and it was terrific for him to see the whole club on the playing side, certainly, coming together like that. Yeah, I mean, Peter does an awful lot of work behind the scenes, but when you get a, uh, an afternoon like that, you know, Peter, you could see the smile on his face because all that hard work, you know, he, see, he does with these young kids and, and everything that goes into it. You know, you see the smiles on their faces just in the picture there. It's terrific. I love to see things like that. And, and our lads are good as gold. We all know that. We see them on a regular basis, our players. And they put their heart and soul into it. They make sure the kids have a good time. And, you know, clearly they did that day. We put a lot of effort as a football club into engaging with our young supporters. I suppose on this level, and you'll know better than me, it's important to keep the young footballers engaged because at that age, they can still move about, can't they? Well, they can. I mean, they can quite easily move about, but we've got to make sure that we, we hone them as best we possibly can. We give them a, a, a brilliant environment to learn and work in as well, which we've clearly got at Finch Farm. And the big bonus ball for them is they get to meet the heroes and have a little bit of a kickabout with them every so often as well. Did I see Tony Hibbert on that piece of film there? Well, talking to heroes, Hibbo <laughs> was there, wasn't he? I mean, but, you know, you look at it, you know, Hibbo's obviously cut a frustrated figure mm. with, his, with his injuries and his his problems this season but you know Tony's a, he's a brilliant lad you know he's still the life and soul around the training training ground with the likes of Aussie and what have you but you know they're getting you know to the latter stages of their careers mm. but they recognize how important it is to engage with the kids and I think the more experienced and older you get you, the, the easier you find to engage with the youngsters. It was a terrific day it always is and what a lovely way to round off part two. Another short break right now but don't switch channels because you don't want to miss a second of our big interview in part three because we sat down at Finch Farm last week with the irrepressible Mickey Thomas. Welcome back to the third segment of this week's programme. Now, in modern day football, in my opinion, the word character is bandied about with indecent regularity. However, our big interview guest this week fits that moniker just about perfectly. He's a lifelong blue who jumped at the chance when Howard Kendall invited him to join Everton. But typically, I suppose you could say, he made a bit of a mess of it. But also, typically, he bears no grudges. He was a wonderfully gifted footballer and he's a lovely, lovely guy. This is Mickey Thomas. Well, I think obviously from a very young age in my family, my father, obviously my first ever game was Everton, um, Sheffield United, the midweek game. Um, Alec Young was playing, I remember that. Um, and Everton won quite convincingly. And you know, it was the first time, under lights it was as well. You know, I'd never been to a football game in my life, so you know, it just captured me as a young boy. And uh, obviously, um, what every part of my family at Evertonians really, you know. Um, me, me, me brothers, my sisters, they all have a time in that. So, yeah, so it goes back a long, long way. And I say, I think when you first go into football and you, whoever you first come across, it probably lets you see me support. Having that family connection to Everton then, what, what did that mean when you, you finally ran out and made your debut as an Everton player? Well, it was obviously I left Manchester United. Obviously, um, I couldn't really handle the pressure at Manchester United in that. You know, uh, great football club, you know, great people, but I felt I needed to get away and, you know, Everton was my next port of call and Howard Kendall, one of the greatest managers of all time, he, he, he wanted to sign me, I signed and I played my first game at home against Birmingham City. I got some pot, we won the game 3-1 and 
Uh, but you know, to come out onto that pitch as a young boy standing in, in the terrace, it was like it, it, quite emotional, really. It, it, it's a big thing for me, really. You know, um, as, as a young boy growing up, you know, playing school football and then getting a trial, joining Wrexham, not ever thinking I would get to that level. So when it happened, it was like a you know amazing feeling for me. So how did it? feel then when you first got that phone call from Howard that he wanted to bring you to Goodison Park? Well, obviously excited, obviously, um, as I said, a, a disappointment. I was going to leave Old Trafford uh, with, with the pressure that was obviously affecting me. And, you know, to get the call off Howard Kendall, you know, um, he was going to be new to the job, of course, but he had obviously good ideas and good intentions to do well for, for Everton Football Club. And he wanted me to be involved in that. And I had no hesitation in signing. Um, I enjoyed it, obviously, but it was a short period of time I was there. Uh, 13 games out of 13 and lucky for me it was 13 because um, after that game I, I, I got injured in that game and I never uh, got fit for a few days and then he said to me he wanted me to play in the reserve game at Newcastle and I said I'm not playing in reserves which was obviously wrong I should have never said that um, what, I, what I said I believe was right um, but I played the ultimate price um, obviously Howard Kendall had no alternative he had to get rid of me had to sell me um, because um, I broke the rules and, and quite rightly he was in the right and I was in the wrong. Initially I didn't think that but uh, obviously as time went by the, uh, I understood that he did the right thing by getting rid of me uh, and it cut my career short, very short at Everton. Is that something that's still a regret to this day? Well I think we all make mistakes in life and obviously that's one of them I, I do regret really because as I said I, I felt like you know I, I could have done well for Everton Football Club. Um, I'm sure he did as well because that's why he signed me. Uh, but unfortunately, as I said, it didn't work that way, and uh, you know he, he became one of the greatest managers of all time. And he, you know, early in his career, he had to make a, a huge decision, and uh, it proved the right one for him, when not you, for me. When you look back over those 13 games, short a spell as it as it was, what are the ones that stand out? Well, I think my home debut, obviously, that 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 is always, uh, I think, important to to any player who comes to a football club and. and get off to a good start. Um, the Everton game was Birmingham City at home. We, we won the game 3-1. I uh, got man of the match in the, all the local papers, etc. So it, it was a good uh, debut for me. Uh, I felt comfortable. Uh, I felt pleased in my performance. And uh, as I said, I didn't foresee what was going to come in, in the next few weeks after what happened on my debut. Did you ever get the chance to speak to Howard later on? Yeah, um, I, I've got on well with Howard, uh, you know, uh, obviously initially uh, it was very heated and that, I, I felt he was wrong for what he did, etc. And, you know, uh, probably he, he felt obviously I was wrong for what I did, which I was. But, you know, we made up and that and, you know, he, he was a wonderful football player, not just a great manager, but also a great human being, Howard Kendall. And, uh, you know, I, I, I respect him without doubt because I already had that. Uh, he had that awe about him as a, as, a, as a former player at Goodison Park. So, you know, he had that about him. But he was a great man. And as I said, his record is incredible. What he did for the football club. And obviously, sadly, now that he's passed away. Did you have an indication while you are here what that team would go on to achieve? Well, I, I would have to be honest and say no. I mean, obviously, very early in, in uh, um, his career as a manager at a football club. You know, um, a lot of pressure on him as well. Early in that career of his as well, uh, he came an immense pressure. Uh, the results weren't good initially, but uh, they showed the confidence given the time, and he built one of the best sides of all time. You know, the likes of Graham Sharp, Kevin Sheedy, people like that. You know, Peter Reid. You know, Neville Southall, best goalkeeper in the world, not just in the in the in the league. Uh, so he had a, he had a, a wonderful side, but that was all down to one man, Howard Kendall. He knew how to get a side together. He knew how to look after them. He knew how to program into each game. Amazing. What about life after Everton, Mickey? What were the highlights of your career when you looked oh, back? Uh, highlights after Everton? No, obviously uh, not on my hair, that's for sure. But uh, I think I had many times where, I, obviously, I look back at my career, but I think 13 clubs I played for. But I, I had a, I don't know, a long career in terms of playing games. I think 700 games, whatever. Um, I obviously played in the cup final before that. I joined Everton for Manchester United and I went to Chelsea, got promotion, had a wonderful time there, wonderful time at Stoke. I think everywhere I went, I, I did well. Unfortunately, the one club I wanted to do well, it didn't do, it didn't do me any good. When you look at this squad, the likes of John Stones, Ross Barkley, Romelu Lukaku, do you see something there that, that can be built on? Well, I, I certainly do. I, I think um, 
I, I think Evertonian's obviously, you know, looking at Lukaku, people talk about, I think a wonderful player, you know, he, he's a goal scorer, but, you know, he, he plays that long role up front. He, I, I, I'm a big fan of Lukaku because I think he's got a lot for Everton Football Club to offer. Uh, I think he's got a great ability. But you mentioned the, the, you know, the Ross Barkley's and obviously Coleman's and that, all good players, all really top players. And I think he's got the nucleus of being a, a very good team and squad and for the future, you know, it's all about results, winning games and that. But I think Everton produce a brand of football that Everton is enjoying at this moment in time. Everton will obviously, for the next few years, hopefully now be with the big boys because, you know, they've not beat that top four or five for, you know, a long, long time. And that's not what Everton is. Well, they want to be successful. They want to be winning trophies. Uh, you know, and they want the top players coming through the, through the, through the door. But... They haven't really been able to do that, but you know, obviously the manager at this moment in time is trying to strive for that and build for that. But you know, Everton's got a great name in the game. There's no question about that. Passionate fans, there's no, there's no question about that either. It's a great football club. It's got great tradition, and you know, but it needs to be stepping up now. And maybe in the next few years they'll be able to do that. Of course, you're back at Finch Farm today, but you're quite often around, Mickey. Is it is nice to come back and catch up with old faces? Yeah, like obviously Jimmy the kit man, Jimmy Martin, I know him well from years, and obviously Sharpie and that people like that. I mean, Sharpie's not here today, but he's probably hiding from me. But yeah, um, yeah, it's great to come back. You know, I mean, obviously I work for Manchester United, and I've, I'm, I do a lot of work for them. They have been magnificent for me. But I like to come back, obviously, and see some old faces here and that because, uh, you know, I've got some great, great times at, at, at Everton Football Club, although for a short period of time. I was talking to Mickey Thomas at Old Trafford last weekend. He's one of those guys, you've only got to look at him and he makes you smile. I was going to say that. He is one of those guys that, you, that he just makes you smile straight away, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's an infectious character, Mick. Mm. And he's, even from a young lad, you know, with me growing up as a, as a kid at Chelsea, Mickey had obviously played for them. And there was all kinds of stories about, you know, the two Welsh boys, Mickey Thomas and, and Joey Jones and the, the amount of times they were found you know, asleep on the floor in the home dressing room at Stamford Bridge after a night out and they couldn't get themselves home. So I knew he was a character, and, uh, but he was a terrific player. Never, never lose mm. sight of the fact that he was, was a say, really good player. He could player. play, couldn't he? Oh, he could play, yeah. I mean, you don't play for Chelsea, Man United the light, mm. and, you know, the Evertons of this world without being a top class player. Typical of Mickey, waits all his life to sign for Everton, then refuses to play for the reserves and makes a mess of the whole thing. Well, I mean, I, I don't know the exact story behind it, but I certainly know that man there, Mr Kendall, wouldn't have uh, taken kindly to Mickey refusing to play. And it just shows that, you know, whatever everybody says about, you know, Howard and, and, and what a brilliant manager he was, he, he, he was ruthless as well. And if you didn't, if you didn't toe the line, you, you paid the consequences. You can't be a successful manager at that level and win what Howard did if you're just a nice guy. You need to be a hard man as well. Of course you do. You've got to, you've got to trust your own instincts. You've got to make difficult decisions. You know somewhere along the line with a squad of players the size of that that you're going to upset people along the way. You've just got to deal with it and you've got to, be, you've got to believe what you're doing is the, is the correct thing. And if that means upsetting somebody, unlucky. Did you get the hairdryer off Howard? Um, a couple of times, yeah, <laughs> a couple of times. But, you know, that's fair, part and parcel of the game. Mm. You know, you, you take it for what it is. You might not like it at the time. But one thing Howard was, was honest. Mm. And he told you it was it is. And you always ultimately respected him for being honest about it. Mickey always says, in all honesty, it was him who made the mistake. He should have played for the reserves at the time. And the way he spoke about Howard in that piece of film just shows the respect that he had for the man. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I've, I've never met a footballer who hasn't got a respect for, for Howard Kendall because everybody recognises, what first and foremost, he, he was a brilliant player. Mm. And secondly, he's still our most successful manager. So, you know, every, everybody speaks very, very highly of him. Um, I was unbelievably fortunate to know him very well. And, and spend plenty of time with him and you know, I miss it, really miss it. It's a big weekend on Merseyside, Graham, the Grand National. Do you want to give the viewers the winner? Well, I've had a look at the field, Des, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not brilliant on the horses, I must admit. I'll leave that to Snods, he's better than me than that. But I just fancy the last samurai. Really? Yeah, the last samurai. But if you've got a couple of quid each way, higher odds, I think there's a, there's a horse named after me, Daz. Wonderful charm. <laughs> 50 to 1. <laughs> Work, might be worth a couple of quid. that one a miss. It's a fantastic <laughs> spectacle though, isn't it? Oh, it's brilliant. I mean, you know, Merseyside's spoiled, isn't it, for, for mm. sport. I mean, we've got, you know, two terrific football clubs. You know, we're clearly better than the other one. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you've got Aintree as well and, and, and everybody looks forward to, to, to that, you know, that week. But the big race on the Saturday, quarter past five, I believe, yeah. Darren, as well. That yeah. could be a bit lively mm. at the start line, couldn't yeah, it? Absolutely. I remember when I was a kid, you'd go and watch Everton in the morning and then 
because yeah. you had a chance to watch the national in the afternoon. Well, I think that might well be some some of the thinking behind putting the, the starting time back as well, so that you know football is so important nowadays that you want to make sure that everybody's able to watch the national because we you know there was times when we were actually playing we'd come in at half time and the first thing you'd ask was who won the national. <laughs> so, you know everybody's got a chance to see it if it starts at quarter past five. Wonderful charm. You heard it here first. Fifty to one. Right, we're three quarters of the way through this week's show. In the final part, we'll hear from Tony Bellew, Tom Cleverley and Kevin Morales. Welcome back to the fourth and final part of this week's programme. Tony Bellew was a guest, of course, on this very sofa a few months ago, and we thought it was high time we caught up with him again. He was at a community event earlier this week, and before discussing his upcoming fight, we spoke to him about the summer departure of his good friend, Tim Howard. He's been immense, not just on the field, off the field. He's been a character in the dressing room for a decade, and some of the lads have always been able to depend on and rely on for advice. Uh, I've seen him give talents off before today at the right times. He's a, a perfect role model professional for any young professional out there to follow. Look what Tim Howard's done. He's been absolutely fantastic, mate. I'm going to miss him. The dressing room is definitely going to miss him, and the lads are going to miss him massively. Uh, be a hard, be a hard set of boots to fill. Tell us about the fight, Tony. All I can say is we're close. We're really close. Listen, I'm fighting a Lungu Makabu for the WBC Cruiserweight title, the most prestigious belt in the world. And it's going to happen within the next 12 weeks. That's the best thing I can say. The hard work already started. Oh, yeah. Listen, I've been in camp for closing in on four weeks. Uh, dieting, trying to get a bit more of this belly off. And I'm working, mate. I'm always working. I'm always training hard. Uh, I'm going through a lot more recovery at this stage now as well, so I'm training really hard, then straight to Finch Farm for recovery, straight back to gym, try and recover some more. So it's a vicious circle that I'm at at the moment, but it will continue for the next eight to 10 weeks, and we'll, uh, we'll see where it gets me. Planning a little trip to Wembley, maybe too, as a, as a break I'm, in between? I'm gonna fit it in. The first thing he said is, uh, everyone let me, Tony, you going to Wembley? And I just said, does a bear do his stuff in the woods? I think he does. He deserves another shot at a world title, doesn't he, Bomber? Because he's one of us. Uh, absolutely, yeah. That alone al allows him another <laughs> shot at the title for sure. But Tony's, you know, he's a massive fan. We all know that. You know, we see him in and around the ground and Finch Farm, and he's he absolutely adores Everton Football Club. So, you know, we just wish him the best and hope it comes off for him. But he's certainly putting the work in. That's for sure. He's terrific in the community as well. Anything we ask Tony Bellew to do, he, he's ferocious in the ring because it's his job. But outside the ring, he's a cracking lad. Yeah, I mean, he, he is, and, and, and he puts a bit of time and effort into the community, as you say, and I think he's a role model, isn't he? So, you know, Everton Football Club, Tony Bellew as a, as a world championship boxer, you know, it's a good fit to, to make sure people stand up and listen to what's got to be said. And a film star. A film star as well, I forgot about that. Beg your pardon, Tom. <laughs> How can you forget that? We were on the red carpet. Well, we were on the red carpet, yeah. <laughs> Right, after three consecutive Premier League defeats, we really do need some confidence boosters before the FA Cup semi-final in two weeks' time. Next up for the Blues, it's Watford at Vicarage Road. We'll be running out to Z Cars, of course. It's their pre-match tune as well. Tom cleverly accepts that we must do better, starting at one of his old stomping grounds. Uh, a lot of good memories there. I had a great year there. Um, under Malky Mackay, thoroughly enjoyed it down there. So. Uh, it'd be good to, to see a few old faces and, and I'm looking forward to playing back there, yeah. How important would you say that season was for your own development? Because you were Player of the Year, weren't you? Yeah, I got Watford's Player of the Year that year. It was a massive confidence boost for me to know that I could really cut it at that level and, and beyond. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it was a really important year in my development and um, and something that I look, at, look back on and as, as really significant. Quite an attacking side, wasn't it? So it must have suited you. Yeah, I mean, we had um, Henry Lansbury as well for, on loan from Arsenal at the time, and me and him combined a lot. Uh, we had Danny Graham scoring loads of goals, and, and Heide Helgerson as well offered us a lot of experience. So, um, yeah, it was a great season for me and, and really enjoyed it. But it's a much changed Watford to the one you remember. It is, yeah. I don't think there's any players there. Craig Cathcart was on loan as well at the same time, but um, and the kit man's still there, but apart from that, I don't think there's, there's many familiar faces for me to see on Saturday. But, of course, it's a, a chance for us to bounce back, isn't it? 
we, we've got to see it as that, and, and I think we have to. Um, it's, it's three league defeats now on the bounce, so it's massively important next week that we get two good results in the, in the two away games, and then and then come into the, the home game the week after in some sort of confidence and leading up to the semi final. So it's, it is a massive game Saturday, and, and one that we really need to to rebound. Graham, what are you expecting from Watford at the weekend? Three points. Mm. Simple as that. I think we've got to look at that. We've got to go into it with that mindset. I'm, I mean, look, I, I think the players did at, at Old Trafford. But as we've already talked about, you know, one, one sloppy mistake costs you. So we've got to make sure we cut them out. And if we do that and play to the best of our ability, we can win this game. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they've got a, they've got a good forward line. There's no doubt. Um, but we've got the players that can deal with that. And we've got players going forward who can score us goals. We often analyse the two potential starting 11s and work out how many we'd take from the opposition. And from Watford, with all due respect, you probably wouldn't take any of them. No, um, and that's no disrespect to them. It's no. just the reality of that we've got a really strong squad, mm -hmm. but we've got to turn our Premier League form round. We've got to start winning some games of football. No better place to start than Vicarage Road this, this coming Saturday. And I fully expect us to get those, those points because you know even us at 80% is good enough to beat Watford, in my opinion. Watford made a decent start to life back in the Premier League. They drew with us, of course, on the opening day. And they'll be glad of that now, won't they? Well, they will. Uh, I think any, any promoted side, if they start well, it just takes that pressure off you. It makes you believe that you, you belong in the Premier League. You can deal with the pressures of playing there and, and, the, and the extra quality that there is no doubt in the league. Um, but it also helps, you know, you've got Igalo, you've got Troy Deeney, mm. two good centre-forwards mm. who can cause defences problems and can score your goals. If you've got... You, Joe Royal always used to say to me, you're only as good as your centre-forwards. And if you, they'll always give you a chance. And, and Watford have relied heavily upon them. And they'll, they'll stay up again and give themselves another chance next year. I like Troy doing He's old school, isn't he? Well, our Belgian international Kevin Morales has been has seen his playing time reduced this season to the odd cameo as a substitute. That's been largely to the excellent form of Aaron Lennon. But Kevin is champing at the bit to get back into his stride. Yeah, it's frustration because for me, these two strange but two yellow cards. Uh, first yellow card, he said to me, diving in 35 yards in the goal. <laughs> it's strange. <laughs> and the second one, uh, Romero passed the ball behind me and then see the player. But uh, the most difficult when uh, you don't play, you see your team lose the game. This is difficult. But now I'm back and I want to give my maximum for helping the team. Uh, Watford on Saturday, uh, a newly promoted team, but a very tough team still. Yeah, he play, he play very well this season. Uh, first six months, he have a top eight in the, in the table. Now a little bit difficult, but he uh, have a lot of uh, good players. Uh, I know his home is a difficult team. Uh, Romelu Lukaku has been in excellent form this season, and as a fellow Belgian, you must be delighted for him. For me, this year is the best player in the, in the season so far. He scored a lot of goals in any competition, and uh, if he don't score a lot of goals this season in, uh, in Premier League, I think the, the Everton is bad in the table. But thank you for that, Rom. I need <laughs> to continue like that because uh, I need to win the, the trophy this season. He was on target for Belgium as well in, in the last uh, international game, so decent for his country as well. Yeah, yeah, now for the country, before, uh, you know, Benteke, a little bit uh, first choice, but now uh, two seasons, Romero scored a lot, a lot of goals. I think now he's the best choice uh, for the striker in the national team, because he's my friend. <laughs> but, <laughs> and Christian play for Liverpool, it's not good for, <laughs> for Everton. But, um, yeah, he, he have only 22 years old, but uh, the maturity is amazing. Graham, a word I've heard bandied about Goodison Park and Finch Farm this season more than ever before is frustration. And I suppose it particularly applies to Kevin. It's been a, it's been a wretched stop-start season for him. It has. I'm a big fan of Kevin Morales. Mm. I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously biased because I love front players and players who are forward-thinking, who can go past a defender and, and create opportunities. I feel, I feel a little bit for Kev. Mm. I, I genuinely do. I think it's been difficult because selection-wise you've had Jerry Delafeo in really good form initially. Aaron Lennon coming into the team and playing a, a really rich vein of form, being in a rich vein of form. Um, you know, getting that balance right between 
attacking too much and maybe not being as solid defensively when we've been conceding goals, I think it maybe has influenced Roberto's team selection at times and meant that Kevin hasn't got in it. I, 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 it's been frustrating for him and he pretty much probably sums up our season, frustrating. But there's still opportunities for Kev to get himself in that, in that semi-final side to, to, to make Roberto pick him and keep him in that side because he's an unbelievably talented player. He's got an eye for a goal, hasn't he? Could he play the number 10? I think he could. I think he could. I don't. I, I think it was West Ham. Was it West Ham in the cup last year where he mm. came on and had a massive influence yeah. just behind Romelu? And I, he's, he's clever enough to do it. That's for certain. Um, and as you say, he, he can score you a goal. He can create you a goal. I just think there's, you know, with with a few weeks of the season left, if we get him going, mm. you know, he could be massive for us, Kev. And of course, he's got the European Championships away for as well. Very much so. That'll be in the in the forefront of his mind as well. Good form for Everton gets himself into that Belgian side. The ideal scenario, especially for Kevin Morales. And that's just about it for this week's show. We're off to Vicarage Road on Saturday, where the press box, believe it or not, is in the Elton John stand. Let's hope our Saturday night's all right. Full commentary from that game, by the way, will be on evertonfc.com with me and the Diamond. Thanks for watching this week. Good luck if you go into the National. We'll be back next week with another Everton show.